Hello, Namaste, Vanakkam Anadha. Myself, Tulsira, and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel, Kick Out GST Phobia, wherein I will be sharing you a lot of interesting stuff relating to the Goods and Services Tax Act with an intention to make GST a good and simple tax act. In this video, I am deliberating on the GST implications on the various e-commerce business models using the case studies of Lenscard, Urban Club and Udan. Hope you people will enjoy it. If you like our video, please click on the like button and if you want more interesting videos like this, then subscribe to our channel and press the bell button so that you will not miss the most important stuff and updates from our channel. So let's get started. Such a beautiful day to start on. So good morning everyone once again. Let's get started. So e-commerce businesses. So before getting or diving into the e-commerce businesses, first I would like to give some, uh, make a note here. So this session, so it will be into two segments, wherein the first segment will be one-on-one. -on -one. So wherein I will be telling you the facts, details, everything. The second segment would be where you will be interacting with me with the, using the chat box. So that the session so will be more interactive and it will be more beneficial for you as well. You will learn only and an, uh, unless and until you involve in that. So that's my uh, so that's what I feel. So with this note, I would like to start my presentation. So e-commerce businesses. So what is commerce? I think many of you who are present here are commerce graduates in one of the other way. So, hook. so the commerce is an activity of buying and selling. It is as simple as that. If you buy something and if you sell something, it amounts to commerce. Then how it is different from e-commerce? It is very simple. If the same commerce, if the act of commerce is done over the internet or on the electronic medium, then it is said to be the e-commerce. So an activity of buying and selling over the internet or using the electronic media is called as the e-commerce. And the person who is operating this e-commerce platforms is called as the e-commerce operator. So it is very important to understand the terminologies of uh, various terms. So we dealt with commerce, e-commerce and e-commerce operator. So what is this e-commerce business? Whether e-commerce is defined under GST law? Yes, the term e-commerce is defined under the GST law and it has the same meaning as we had uh, understood in the common parlance. So in India, if you want to do e-commerce business, then GST will come into picture. Even the oxygen in India is being taxed by GST. So be careful. Even e-commerce businesses are uh, taxable under GST. So when you hear this term e-commerce, what is the first thing that will come into your mind? Obviously Amazon. I would like to know who is the founder of this Amazon, such a big e-commerce businesses that the world have ever seen. And you are correct. Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon. Bezos looks very happy because he, he is now the world's richest guy. He is competing one and two, but he is the world's richest guy. It's because of his e-commerce business. So let us ask him why he is feeling so happy. So Bezos is telling, I'm happy and excited to start my e-commerce business in India. So I know you people are aware, Amazon is having presence, presence in India, but I'm taking you to the new world where there is no Amazon and where it wants to start its business in India. So Bezos is very happy and excited to start the e-commerce businesses in India. But Bezos seems worried now. I would like to ask Bezos, what happened Bezos? Yes, I am worried about the compliances in India for running my business. Bezos, it's not only you 
who are worried for the compliances in india after all every business is supposed to follow n number of compliances to start the business in india so bezos wants to know what all the compliances that he need to be uh, followed when he is starting the e-commerce business in india so let's have a broad picture of the various statutes which will be applicable on this e-commerce business so we'll start with the income tax act 1961 the very old act the consumer protection act 1986 the information technology act 2000 the foreign exchange management act 2000 the payment and settlement systems act 2000 competition companies and nevertheless the goods and services tax act 2017 which is the primary focus that we are going to uh, put in this particular deliberation yes the world is temporarily closed i did not question you why the world is temporarily closed because you know the answer it's because of the corona corona is everywhere corona is everywhere the world is temporarily closed then how can i do the business if the world is temporarily closed on the one hand all the countries the economies are heading towards the depression and if you step out of your home the police people are ready with their lotties to take charge on you and the social media is making uh, these terms quite famous stay home stay safe and we people are getting influenced and we are not going out we are not working then how come a business can perform and um, serve the people in large and the nas- the governments have imposed the national wide uh, national wide lockdowns which was never done in the history so because of this covid pandemic if you look at other businesses i mean to say businesses which are other than the e-commerce businesses they are worried just like this old man they are thinking how can we tackle this how can we come how can we come out of this the biggest pandemic that the world have ever seen and they are actually drowning in the crisis and they are waiting and looking for the helping hands they are fighting for the survival whereas the e-commerce businesses making humongous profits billions billions of profits despite the lockdown despite the recession despite the depression in the economy despite the lockdown being imposed all over the world e-commerce businesses are making humongous profits billions yes billions of profits why what makes them unique whereas on the one hand the other businesses are facing and fighting for the survival on the other hand the e-commerce businesses are making humongous profits and pursuing this covid-19 pandemic as a job opportunity as the business opportunity it is because of their business model yes it is because of their business model they are able to make billions of profits and guys today we are going to look at the various business models through which the e-commerce businesses are operating and particularly we will be digging into the provisions of gst that has impact on the e-commerce businesses so let's have some basic understanding of the business models through which the e-commerce businesses work so prima facie there are two business models one is the inventory based business model and the second one is the market placed business model so by this time you could have understood so what does the inventory based business model mean or what does the market placed business model mean if you don't understand then it's fine we'll get to know about that in a detailed way so first we look into the the first the very own uh, business model the inventory based e-commerce business model <clears throat> so 
so in this e-commerce model the goods and services these are owned by the e-commerce entity itself so either they will manufacture the goods using their own manufacturing units or they will procure from the third party vendors and they will store that in their warehouses then they will supply that to the end customers so the, in the inventory based model the ownership of the goods which is being traded on the internet or on the website of any uh, company so then they are then they will fit into this inventory based model i will i would like to know from the audience so can any one of you give the example of this inventory based model which you have seen in your practical world so you can use your chat box so in this model the goods and services are owned by the e-commerce entity itself so using their website they will sell the products directly to the end customers so i am looking at the chat box uh, maybe a misho perfect so any one of you do you have any other uh, companies which will fit into this category of inventory based model so how many of you here who is uh, uh, listening to this lecture are wearing spectacles or who are having sight so you would be well uh, aware of particular company lens cart so wherein they will trade the contact lenses the power glasses and even uh, so like these sort of products so they will fit into this inventory based model and we are going to understand their business model and the gst implications in a detailed way in the upcoming slides of our presentation so so this is one type of e-commerce business model the next one is the marketplace business model so here the e-commerce operator they will not have any ownership on the goods what they will do is they will just facilitate the trade between the vendor and the buyer okay so here the ownership is not with them they will facilitate the trade between the buyers and the sellers so sellers will be looking for the prospective customers and buyers will be looking for the goods so the sellers will list their products on a particular website which is owned by a third party so where the buyer will come to that website he will place the order and the actual vendor will deliver the products directly to the buyer so this is a case of marketplace e-commerce business model i would like to know from the audience have you ever come across these sort of business models in your practical life you can unmute yourself and you can give some examples uh flipkart yes flipkart so basically all majority are into this marketplace correct because they have to reduce the inventory cost and warehousing costs yes so just like harish has mentioned flipkart will fit into this category of business model the strong comp competitor of flipkart the amazon is also equally fits into this uh, model of e-commerce at the same time the popular zomato which was listed recently and made a uh, humongous profits and so on swiggy so there are so like the majority of the businesses they are into this sort of this type of business model marketplace business model but the way the marketplace business model operates is quite uh, broader so there are many ways which through which they will operate their business so let's try to understand uh, Uh, in brief what are all the models that are there within the marketplace e-commerce business model so the first thing is business to business model so wherein the business people will list their products in the e-commerce platform and the business buyers will buy the products the second one is a business to consumer model wherein the business people will list their products in the website and the consumers who are not into the business they will consume so in this way there are so many types consumer to consumer model 
business to government model government to business model government to citizen model and consumer to business model so these are the broader uh, ways through which the marketplace e-commerce business model operates so now we got a brief idea of the various e-commerce business models so the first thing is inventory based e-commerce business model the second thing is marketplace e-commerce business model the main intention of making this presentation is to understand the impact of gst on the various e-commerce business models so in this video or in this deliberation you would be, we would be dealing with the levy and collection of tax registration the invoicing requirements the input tax credit the returns and the tax collection at source and finally the ev bill so broadly we will be looking into the levy and collection registration invoicing input tax credit returns tcs and ev bill provisions so for the purpose of deliberation i have broadly classified our uh, this video into three types so one wherein we will be dealing the uh, dealing with the gst impact on the inventory based model using the case study of lens cut in second case we will be dealing with the marketplace business model which are providing specified services this specified services this i am quoting as per gst so we will be understanding this using the case study of urban club and the finally we will be dealing with the uh, marketplace business model wherein the goods and other than specified services will be traded so we will be understanding uh, this using the case study of udan which is as similar to amazon so let's get started so inventory based e-commerce business model and the best example for this is lens cut <clears throat> when you are uh, roaming in the roads you would be coming across the franchises of lens cut here and there and even when you are uh, searching for something in tax guru or any other platform you will find ad ad advertisements from lens cut so if you click on that it will take you to the website so as you can see you can see the business of lens cut franchise model where offline stores will be there and the second one is e-commerce model where you will be going into the website and you will be placing the orders so here the the most common thing is the goods which is being traded by lens cut is completely owned by them only it is their own product they either they will manufacture themselves or they will procure from the famous brands and they will store that in their warehouses so franchise model i think you people are well aware of that but since our main focus is on the e-commerce so in this video we will focus on the supplies that the lens cart is making through the e-commerce website that is www.lenscart.com so we are entering into the second segment so which will be more interactive so i will be expecting answers from all of you here we have seniors juniors colleagues everyone so i am not taking and telling you any new provision but i am just collating everything and putting in a organized way that's it you have answers for all these uh, queries that i am going to put on later on so registration so so kindly open your chat box and be ready to answer whether lens cut is liable to take registration if their aggregate turnover is less than 40 lakhs yes or no so i'm just looking at the chat box so i need participation of everyone whether lens cut is liable to take gst registration if their if their uh, aggregate turnover is less than 40 lakhs 
Harish is saying yes. Suhas is saying yes. Abhishek is saying yes. Lalita is saying yes. Fantastic. Good response. This is motivating me to deliberate on this. But the answer to this question is no. Lens card is not supposed to take registration. If it is, if its aggregate turnover is not exceeding the 40 lakhs or the threshold limit. The reason for this is section 22. So here the assumption is lens card is not making any interstate supplies. So they are just having a website. They, they are making all the deals over the website only and their aggregate turnover all over India is within the 40 lakhs since they are into goods. Since the aggregate turnover is not exceeding 40 lakhs, they are not supposed to take registration. If their aggregate turnover exceeds 40 lakhs, then yes, the answer could be yes, they are supposed to take GST registration. Yes, I can understand there are mixed answers. So we can discuss about that in the later stage. The next thing is levy and collection. See Lenscart. So they have an e-commerce portal like www.lenscart.com. So where customers like us, Harish, you, myself, and many of you will go to that website and will place order. Okay. So the order will get processed. We will make the online payments and the spectacles will be delivered at our doorstep. So now, who is supposed to collect the tax and remit the tax to the government? So I'm asking whether it is chargeable under forward charge mechanism or reverse charge mechanism. I'm expecting answers from all the audience. Who is supposed to pay tax? Whether Lenscard is supposed to collect tax and remit to the government or the customers like us, we will directly pay taxes to the government. Okay. Yes, lens cut. Power charge mechanism. Yes, you are absolutely right. In terms of section 9, subsection 1 of CGST Act, so this particular transaction is taxable under forward charge mechanism, wherein the lens cut will collect taxes from the end customers like us and will pay and will remit the taxes to the government. Okay, lens cuts turnover is exceeding 40 lakhs and as Harish was also told it is compulsory registration for them. Let's agree with that. Okay, now what are all the returns that they are supposed to file? It'll be simple, GSTR 1, monthly returns like GSTR 1, GSTR 3B, annual returns like 9 and 9C, provided if it is applicable, but lens cut is such a big entity where its turnover is obviously more than 5 crore. So all, these are all the returns that the e-commerce business is supposed to file. So with this, we'll move on to the next segment. Invoicing. Who is supposed to issue the tax invoice to the customer? Obviously Lenscart. But when? When is Lenscart is liable to issue the tax invoice? See, if they're operating under franchisee model, then it, the over-the-counter sales will happen. And at the, when we are making payments only, then they will, uh, at the time of delivery of goods to us, they will issue the tax invoice. But what, when are they supposed to issue the tax invoice when we order the products using their website? In terms of section 31, if there is a movement of goods involved, then they are supposed to raise the tax invoice before or at the time of removal of goods. So let's take a scenario where I'm wearing specs, right? So this I have ordered from Lenscart. I went to the Lenscart uh, website, ordered these spectacles, they processed, I made the payment also. Now what they will do is, they will direct the person from warehouse to deliver to me, okay? So now when the goods are dispatched from the warehouse, at that time, lens card is supposed to raise the tax invoice so i hope everyone is clear with this tcs whether tcs provisions is applicable to an e-commerce entity like lens card so we have seniors and juniors here so i think many of the seniors would be well aware of the tcs provisions 
and i don't expect juniors to know because they might not have read this provision so i would like to give a brief idea of the tcs provision see if any third party vendor is supplying his own products using the third party website to the end customers then the third party website will collect the consideration on behalf of the third party vendor and is supposed to deduct tcs at the rate of 1% on the consideration received from the end customer so this you don't worry we'll understand in a better way so with this little introduction here there are only two parties involved lenskart and end customers there is no third party vendor involved here so tcs will be applicable only when the third party vendor using the lens cut will sell his products to the end consumers but that is not happening and also lens cut is con- co- collecting the consideration and it is for them only they are not remitting that to anyone so the tcs component will not be there so lens cut need not take tcs registration and they need not collect any tcs on the consideration that they are receiving from the end customers next is input tax credit i think everyone is well aware of this provisions section 16 of cgst act talks about the eligibility and the criteria for the input tax credit wherein the lens cart can take the credit provided if they have the valid tax invoice they have received the goods and their supplier i told you right lens cart will be buying procuring these lenses from the different manufacturer so they will be charging invoice and tax to lens cart so the question is whether lens cart can take credit obviously yes because they are using it for the business purpose only and they are filing their returns and their vendor is also paying the taxes to the government and lens cart lens cart has received the goods and they have the valid tax invoice okay now the final thing the e way bill spectacles is a good i don't think any spectacle will be costlier uh, like more than 50000 but assuming it is worth some 1 lakh rupee lens cart is sending this through a courier agency to the end customer like me or you whether e bill is required i am asking you the audience you can reply in the chat box whether lens cart is required to generate e bill i have received one answer no yes okay yes whether lens cut is supposed to raise the eva bill yes okay yes you are right lens cut since they are making the moving the consignment what the value more than 50000 they are supposed to raise the eva bill in terms of rule 138 if lens cart is handing over that goods to the courier agency then the lens cart can delegate that responsibility to the courier agency in terms of second provision to rule 138 so the courier agency will generate the eva bill on behalf of the lens cart he may or he may not but it is compulsory for lens cart it is optional for courier agency but in practical world all the courier agencies will generate the eva bill so this is all you need know, to understand when it comes to inventory based e-commerce business model so let's go into the next part of our presentation where we'll be talking about the marketplace business model where goods and other than specified services are being traded what is specified services that will be the next thing for the time being we are dealing with other than specified services and we are dealing with goods so to help you understand in a better way i am going to explain this model using the case study of udan i think many people might have heard about this particular e-commerce company udan wherein the factories who are registered under gst the companies they will list their products in the udan and uh, like hiragangan associates they want to procure some air conditioner 
even hiragang and associates are registered under gst they want to procure some 10 air conditioners for their business so now hiragang associates can either go to the showroom and they can purchase or instead they can go to the wudan website and they can place order for some 10 air conditioners so which the wudan will divert that order to the manufacturer of air conditioner for suppose panasonic and panasonic will deliver that goods air condition directly to Hiragang and Associates. So this is how the marketplace business model works. Unlike in inventory based model, in inventory based model, there are only two parties involved. Whereas in marketplace, there are three parties. The actual vendor of the goods or the other than specified services. The second one is the e-commerce entity and the third one is the buyers. So this can be, you can take an example of Amazon also wherein uh, they will be <coughs> even they have this business model, but Amazon is having a blend of various business models. So you can we can talk about that throughout a day to understand the business of Amazon. It's such a big thing. So let's make the things easy and simple. So that's the reason I have chosen Udon as a case study for letting you know the com uh, consequences. As I said, in Udan, there are three parties. GST registered vendor, second one Udan ECO, the third one is the GST registered buyer. So what Udan does is, they are facilitating the trade between the actual vendor and the end buyer. So here the actual vendor will give powers to Udan to collect the consideration on behalf of them. So what happens is, I am Hiragang and Associates. I want 10 air conditioners. I will go to Wudan website. I will place order and I will pay amount to Wudan. Now Wudan will deduct his commission and GST on that and he will deduct the TCS portion and the balance amount it will be remitted to the end customer. And finally the goods will be sent to the end customer by the registered vendor itself. But here there are so many business models where Udan is having their own warehouses where the registered vendor will send the goods first to the warehouse. Then from there the goods are dispatched. So let's take a scenario or create a scenario where Udan is not having any warehouse. On receipt of order from Udan, the registered vendor will directly send the goods to the registered buyer. So we will understand the GST implications on this particular model. In the same way, I'm looking at the chat box. So here we have got three parties. One is the actual vendor. In our case, Hindustan Unilever Limited, FMCG. Second one is the e-commerce operator, Budan. Third one is the end customers. Let's talk about the GST implications on the first two parties, Hindustan Unilever Limited. It will list its products in the Budan website and it will send it to the customers. Now I'm asking you, the aggregate turnover of Hindustan Unilever Limited is less than 40 lakhs. In, in real life, it is not less than 40 lakhs, but take an assumption. The aggregate turnover of Unilever is less than 40 lakhs. Whether Hindustan Unilever Limited is liable to take GST registration? Shiv Prasad Bro is telling yes. Despite not having uh, the threshold limit, the aggregate turnover not exceeding threshold limit. So Shiv Prasad Bro is telling yes. Amruta ma'am is telling no. She is going with section 22. Threshold limit, the aggregate turnover is not exceeding the threshold limit. So not no registration. Okay, let's reveal the result. But hold on. Whether at the same time, whether Udan is liable to take GST registration if its turnover is not exceeding 40 lakhs or 20 lakhs as the case may be. Udan, yes. Amrutam is telling yes. Udan is liable to take the GST registration. Amarnath is telling yes. Rashi is telling yes. Yes. Udan is supposed to take compulsory registration under GST irrespective of its threshold. 
but why it is because of section 24 which provides for the compulsory registration so if you take section 24 clause 10 <clears throat> in terms of that section the udan is compulsorily required to take the gst registration 24 clause 10 talks about every eco is liable to take compulsory registration irrespective of the threshold limit it is regular registration how about tcs they are supposed to collect tcs so the same section section 24 but the clause 6 talks about compulsory tcs registration in the instant case udan is supposed to deduct the tcs so if they want to deduct the tcs they are supposed to take the tcs registration compulsorily hul compulsory registration yes some of our friends told hul is not required to take registration just because its turnover is not exceeding the threshold limit so the answer would be they are compulsorily compulsorily required to take registration in terms of section 24 clause 9 where any vendor of goods is supplying through an eco then he is compulsorily required to take the gst registration irrespective of whether their aggregate turnover is exceeding the threshold limit or not however there is an exemption given for service providers other than specified service providers for suppose uh you can take an example of a, a <coughs> lawyer so he uh, he is representing himself in one website wherein people is approaching them so whether lawyer is supposed to take registration he is not required to take if his aggregate turnover is less than 20 lakhs even though he is supplying his services through an eco but this option is not available for the vendor of goods so this is given only explicitly for the vendors of goods ah uh, vendors of services not vendor of goods so i hope this is clear let's talk about levy and collection whether udan here there are two legs of transactions hindustan unilever is selling the goods to the end customers and udan is charging commission from the hindustan unilever limited so whether these transactions are taxable under forward charge mechanism or reverse charge mechanism udan is invoicing to hul whether udan is supposed to collect tax from hul and remit to government or unilever will themselves will pay directly to the government power charge very nice udan will collect the taxes from hul and will remit to the government fabulous the next leg where hul is supplying to the end customers <clears throat> in our case the end customer is also registered guy like uh, hind uh, okay hindustan unilever is selling goods to end customer this is taxable under forward charge or reverse charge forward charge or reverse charge whether hul will collect tax from end co consumer and remit to government or the consumer directly will remit to the government okay i have received it is taxable under forward charge yes it is taxable under forward charge let's talk about the returns okay hindustan unilever limited so i just want to know is there any new return that they want to file apart from 1 to uh, 3b 99c okay no no response so i am assuming okay tds return okay accepting the credit fine how about udan apart from gstr 1 gstr 3b 9 and 9c are they supposed to file any return yes they are supposed to file gstr 7a tds return <clears throat> even unilever will go to the portal and they will accept the credit and uh, they will get that credit so even i should have included that in case of hul also but nevertheless let's move ahead next is invoicing this is the 
biggest confusion any tax professional or even a uh, layman will be having who will issue invoice to whom see hiragang associates they are placing order in, in udan but the goods are being delivered by hwl who will issue invoice to whom so it is very simple the hindustan unilever limited will raise tax invoice on the name of hiragang and associates who's end customer and hiragang and associates they can take the credit provided if such goods are used in the course of furtherance of business <coughs> then what now udan is supplying services to hwl on the other hand for which they will be collecting the commission so for which they will be issuing the tax invoice so to the extent of commission the udan will raise a tax invoice to hwl so it is very simple right hwl will raise tax invoice to the end customer it's clear and udan will raise tax invoice to the hwl so the myth that udan will issue tax invoice to the end customer is uh, removed just like we will be of the view that amazon is invoicing to us but actually the actual vendor will invoice to us so i hope this is clear <clears throat> the next one is tcs provisions whether udan is supposed to collect tcs of course yes because they are trading the goods belonging to the third party and they are collecting the consideration for that goods on behalf of the third party so here on behalf of unilever udan is collecting the consideration from the end customer so on the consideration received from the end customer udan is supposed to deduct tcs at the rate of 1% so input tax credit again section 16 if it is used in the course of furtherance of business and all the conditions under section 16 is getting satisfied then anyone can take credit so uh, e way bill so this is very important now hiragang and associates have ordered in udan website the goods are delivered by hwl who is supposed to raise the e way bill usually the person who is causing the movement normal uh, normally hwl is supposed to raise the e way bill however they can delegate that to udan or they can delegate to courier agency so either of them so in this case three parties can raise the e way bill either hwl as a supplier of goods can raise or udan as a ecbo can raise the e way bill or any other courier agency they can also raise the e way bill so it's clear so now we are moving on to the last part last part of our uh, presentation the last business model in the marketplace model supplying only specified services so throughout the session we are telling specified services specified services specified services what is this specified services all about so how will these specified services will create an implication under gst so it's very fascinating to know all these provisions so let me get started with the notification issued by the central government <clears throat> so this notification has come uh, by means of section 9 subsection 5 by way of notification 17 oblique 2017 and 23 oblique 2017 wherein they have specified some services if that services are rendered through an ecbo then it is deemed that the ecbo is supplying that service not the actual supplier of such service i hope you people understood but let's try to understand using the case studies you will get clear understanding <clears throat> so the first thing that they have notified is services by way of transportation of passengers by a road taxi motor cab maxi cab motorcycle can i know the example for this sort of service where the ecbo is required to deduct oh, no. exactly ola and uber ola and uber even though they are not providing the actual services to the end customers they are deemed to be the supplier of service in terms of section 9 subsection 5 and then read with this notification 17 and 
So the next thing that we are going to <clears throat> look into is services by way of providing accommodation and all these things. So may I know the example from all of you audience? Which company will fall under this category? Oyo. Oyo, Airbnb. Exactly. I guess Airbnb, Airbnb is not in India. Oyo. Oyo Hotels. Even though the actual service is provided by the hotel, but it is deemed that if they have the OA franchise, it is deemed that OA is providing that service to the end customer. Nice. We'll go to the next thing. Services by way of housekeeping, like plumbing, carpentering. <clears throat> Just like plumbers, they will provide all these services. But there is one platform where the plumbers can go and register and they can provide the services. Can you know the platform? What I'm talking about? Urban Clap. Urban, Urban Clap. Company. Urban Clap, named as Urban Company. Yes, you people are right. So today we are going to understand the marketplace e-business model in this category of specified services and explicitly the third one, services by way of housekeeping using the case study of Urban Club. Change, renamed as Urban Company. <clears throat> this is how the Urban Club logo looks like. But you would be surprised to know Urban Club or Urban Company is not only providing the specified services, but they are also providing other than specified services, which makes the business model quite complex. And we need to be more careful when we are looking at the GST complications. But to make our presentation and understanding simple, today we are looking into the transaction where Urban Club is only providing the specified services like plumbing, housekeeping services. But the, to understand the business model of Urban Club, what they, they will do is, they will connect the service seekers with the service providers. Plumbers will be there, they will be looking for some work. People like us <clears throat> will be having some issue in our home, we need a plumber. So what we'll do is, we'll go to the Urban Club, we will uh, purchase, uh, we'll place an order, I don't know, we'll book an appointment, with some plumber, then he will come to our home, he will do the service. But here, even though the actual service is being given by the plumber, but in the eyes of GST, it is not the plumber who is providing that service to the end customer, but it is the urban company who is providing the service to the end customer. So, an urban company is supposed to get, uh, is supposed to follow all the GST compliances as if he is the supplier of the service. To your, uh, <clears throat> information, urban company is having uh, professionals like tutors, lawyers, photographers, electricians, and these are not housekeeping. So you, now you feel, uh, and actually the urban company is not supposed to deduct TCS. It's not supposed to deduct TCS, but when you go to Google and search for the GSTN of urban company, and if you search in the GST portal, you will find Urban company has taken so many TCS registrations. It is because they are providing the services which are not specified under that notification also. Not specified under 9.5. <clears throat> so it is very much the actually nowadays the e-commerce businesses, they have a blend of various models which makes our job as a professional more interesting and challenging. But in this part will uh, discuss only with respect to the specified services. <clears throat> As I mentioned, even in this model, there will be three parties. One is the housekeeping, so actual service providers. Second one is the demand service provider, that is urban company. Third one is the end consumer. Now I'm going to ask you people, registration. Whether the plumbers are supposed to get registered under GST just because they are providing their services through an ECO? I'm asking you. Obviously, the pl plumber's turnover will be less than 20 lakhs. And some case, 
maybe more than 20 also <coughs> yes <laughs> exemption no correct these people they are not supposed to get registered then who is supposed to get registered it is the urban company who is due to be the supplier of service in the hands in the eyes of gst is supposed to get registered so the urban company even if its turnover is not exceeding a specified threshold limit they are supposed to get registered in terms of 24 section 24 clause 4 compulsory registration vendors they are not liable to get registered however if uh, there will be some vendors who will be doing services uh, uh, not only through this urban club on their own also in that case if their turnover is exceeding <clears throat> this aggregate turnover then they can take registration and they can discharge the taxes but altogether to dive into this it's a very big ocean you need to examine each and everything today i'm going to give you the brief idea of what's happening levy and collection as you are all aware the plumber is not liable to get registered urban company is liable to get registered so they will collect the taxes from the end consumer it is as simple as that forward charge mechanism so they will collect the consideration from the consumer and they will pay back that to the plumber it is as good as we have discussed in udan it's quite similar correct but here in terms of section 52 by way of explanation they have specifically excluded the taxable value of services which are provided in relation to section 9 sub section 5 <clears throat> so whatever consideration the urban club is receiving for the services provided by the plumber they are not supposed to collect the tcs so if they collect 1 lakh from the consumer they can pay the 1 lakh without any tcs <clears throat> but if you see urban club as i told you earlier they have other models also there they are supposed to collect the tcs returns it's quite similar to a normal regular registered taxpayer maybe 99c the final thing invoicing who will issue invoice it is deemed that urban company is a supplier so the urban company will issue the tax invoice tcs no tcs provisions applicable for urban company itc yes urban company can take the credit provided if they are using it for the business and they are satisfying section 16 so with this i would like to close my presentation so thank you for such an interactive participation from all of you so yes so if you want if you have any doubts or if you have uh, uh, any feedback or if you want to understand in detail about all the provisions then you can see the write up i understand uh, so there might be some errors which might have crept i totally take the responsibility of that and i would be privileged to know the mistakes and to uh, i will be corrected